Thanks, Rita. I know I'm uh, up against the brakes. So I'll try to go quickly and uh, provide a bit of an update on bioreservable scaffolds. I think uh, this year we we represent a hope for our field, so I, uh, I take that very personally and seriously. Um, I think we've all seen from all of our live case demonstrations that uh, even short segment occlusions, uh, when uh, treated with balloon angioplasty, often result in, in complicated dissection. Uh, and amongst many things, here's an OCT picture of that TP trunk we dilated. You can look at these as if a bomb has gone off in the artery, and it's hard to imagine that this will stay open very long uh, without scaffolding. Um, you've heard, and I'm going to quickly uh, go over uh, the rationale for using drug eluding technologies where in, uh, in hierarchical analyses, drug eluding stents have been shown for short lesions uh, to be effective. Uh, I think this uh, image sort of uh, recapitulates that, that all the drug eluding stent studies has been sh shown so far until Saval have j relatively short lesions. The DCB studies, as uh, Matt just showed you, are longer lesions in the real world. And the truth is we probably need both of these technologies uh, for our patients. Um, so there remain uh, unmet needs for this patient population. And the ideal treatment uh, would have a drug eluding technology uh, that will scaffold the vessel to minimize this effect of recoil uh, and will eventually leave nothing behind. Ergo, uh, the rationale for developing a bioresorbable scaffold. Um, and this is really the hypothesis that's driving uh, this field. Uh, Abbott has dubbed this the drug eluding resorbable scaffold to recapitulate the importance of drug elution. But again, a combination of a drug scaffold uh, with a uh, resorbable platform seems to be the perfect solution uh, in, in uh, our pie in the sky view. Many of you are familiar with the first generation bioresorbable uh, BVS scaffold from Abbott. It was a PLLA scaffold with a semi crystalline. A structure uh, that provided uh, adequate radial strength comparable to coronary drug eluting stents. It uses everolimus, which is a cytostatic mTOR inhibitor uh, akin to serolimus uh, with a, a PDLLA excipient that allows for staged and, and very controlled drug elution over time. Uh, and this is what the histopathology looks like from animal models uh, at one year, two years, three years, and then subsequently four years follow-up in animal models, you see that essentially there's little evidence that a scaffold had ever been implanted in this vessel. Uh, my colleague Ramon Varco in Australia has had the greatest experience with this technology in the first generation. Uh, his group uh, has now completed five-year follow-up uh, on his initial cohort of patients. He uh, was serially, in a, in a registry fashion, implanting the first generation BVS in Rutherford three to six patients in whom he felt they had life expectancy greater than one year uh, in single or, or de novo lesions uh, that were in tandem. Uh, he used all th three of the infrapopliteal vessels with a reference vessel of 2.5 to 4 millimeters. Uh, and his five-year data are frankly breathtaking. He has uh, 48 patients that uh, were enrolled with a mean age of 82. He treated 55 limbs with 71 scaffolds distributed as shown here throughout the, the infrapopliteal circulation. Uh, and he showed sustained clinical success. Here are data from the Rutherford Becker class uh, before and after uh, with sustained improvements. Uh, and here are the five-year Kaplan-Meier data for primary patency and CDTLR respectively. Uh, with primary patency of 72% and CDTLR, uh, freedom from CDTLR of 91%. Um, he then uh, pooled his data with Steve Coombe, whom you heard from earlier, and Atman Shah from Chicago, and, and they have uh, their pooled data now looking at 125 patients with 156 lesions treated, mean diameter 3.2, slightly bigger than those studied in the Saval trial. Uh, and these are their data at two years. Primary patency of 88.6%, again, in these relatively short lesions uh, with a bioresorbable scaffold. Uh, and so there's extremely high technical success, uh, excellent long-term patency, uh, and uh, really excellent limb salvage results uh, with follow-up follow data out to five years. So with these data in hand, there has been a, a rush of interest in the space. And I'm not going to go over all of the other technologies, but there's clearly other devices out there. Biotronic has a magnesium-based bioresorbable scaffold. Merrill Life Sciences has a similar PLLA-type uh, uh, bioresorbable scaffold. Uh, the Riva technology uh, is now uh, in clinical application in, in Europe uh, and is being used. Uh, and, and a startup in, in, in uh, California is working on a, a femoropopliteal uh, bioresorbable scaffold. 
So with this, Abbott has refined their first generation BVS. This is now the Esprit BTK Ever Elemis eluding resorbable scaffold. That's a mouthful. Um, it has 100 microgram per square centimeter dose density of Ever Elemis with a similar uniform drug delivery characteristic, very analogous to the Zion's coronary drug eluding stent. And importantly, the strut thickness has been reduced from 150 microns now to 99 microns, consistent with contemporary coronary drug eluting stents. Um, I'm proud to be a co-principal investigator with my friend Brian DiRobertis and Ramon Varco on the LIFE BTK pivotal trial, which I'm also proud to report to you today has completed enrollment. Uh, like Sava, we had the misfortune of starting a global complex randomized trial right before COVID. Uh, and we've been able now to enroll 261 patients in a two to one randomized fashion across the world. Uh, what is a little bit new, just as with Saval and with other below the knee uh, scaffolds and uh, drug coated balloons, we've been asked by regulatory agencies to extend the primary efficacy endpoint out to 12 months, which we have done. Uh, and we have uh, FDA approval for a primary efficacy endpoint of patency and limb salvage with a primary safety endpoint of major adverse limb events and perioperative death. And we'll be likewise following these patients out to five years. Um, obviously, this uh, primary efficacy endpoint, and this is part of the discussion perhaps later, is that we were looking at freedom from above ankle amputation, 100% total occlusion, and importantly, binary restenosis, which is something that distinguishes this trial from some of the other predecessors. Uh, we'll also, of course, be looking for clinically driven TLR. Uh, we have endeavored really to have a, a diverse patient population. I'll show you some early demographic data, which I'm now free to disclose to you. Um, and we have uh, really mandated that vessel preparation be done fastidiously, however, non with an without an atheroablative technique. We have multiple core laboratories that are reviewing the data. And importantly, there is a wound core lab. Dr. Raghu Kurluri uh, is the director of the Centropic Core Lab. And there will be careful wound analysis as part of the data set uh, when we uh, complete the study. Um, again, these are Rutherford four and five patients, not dissimilar to what you saw for Saval, and the total scaffold length has to be less than 170 millimeters. These are the final enrollment characteristics. The predominant number of patients is, of course, enrolled here in the United States, and we have a, a number of patients enrolled in Australia, New Zealand, uh, and the Asia Pacific market. Um, our gender balance is uh, to about two to one male, uh, about uh, uh, 80, 81% are non-Hispanic, uh, and then we have 17% Hispanic patients. Uh, here's the racial uh, demographics. Uh, again, uh, the predominant number of patients are Caucasian. Um, these are the demographics of their risk factors. Uh, a high burden of comorbid illness with tobacco, hypertension, and, and hyperlipidemia. 71% diabetic substrate. Uh, which is perhaps the highest ever in, recorded in one of these trials, uh, and a significant uh, burden of disease uh, with prior peripheral arterial disease. So again, I, th I think although drug-enhanced therapy was successful above knee, we have not seen such success in the below knee segment. I think that's been said over and over this morning. The ideal tibial treatment will likely involve drug delivery, a method of preventing recoil, uh, and leave future options open. Uh, feasibility studies with the first generation absorb BVS uh, were successful with excellent long-term patency and freedom from TLR. Uh, and I, we are delighted to announce that the Life BTK trial has now completed enrollment. And hopefully within the next 12 months, we'll have completion of our data analysis. And around this time, hopefully next year, uh, we'll be able to present our final data. Thanks so much.